Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about uh, the history from English origins to the United States um, of policing in America. And uh, this lecture should last uh, 30 to 35 minutes. Um, so let's, uh, let's get to it. So we're going to talk about the following things today uh, via this introduction to the history of policing in America. Um, we're going to talk about the origins of Western policing, policing in the United Kingdom and England, early American policing models. We're going to talk about policing in the 19th and 20th century by way of eras of policing in the United States. And those are the political era, the reform era, and the community era. And we're also going to talk about those uh, early American um, police officials um, and government officials who had uh, contributions to early American policing models. And then we're also going to talk about what social changes uh, shaped American policing along the way and how do these legacies relate to today's system of policing in America. So some of the early faces of English and colonial officers uh, of the law were the sheriff, the constable, and the coroner, and the justice of the peace. We have uh, law enforcement officials across the United States that are sheriffs, and uh, this comes from the term sheriff, uh, which is uh, an English uh, version of today's sheriff. Um, and they were the enforcement arm uh, for the king. And, and they maintained law and order in the tithings. Um, they also collected taxes. Um, if you have watched any of the um, uh, Robin Hood movies, I mean, you had the sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, the sheriff of Nottingham, who was, you know, basically collecting taxes and doing the king's bidding uh, for him in the territory, um, the rural territories outside uh, of the, you know, main population of the uh, king's gatherings or castles or so to speak. Um, and the basic source in today's environment, the sheriff is the basic source of rural crime control in the United States. And at the turn of the 19th century, um, we saw an increase in popularity uh, and political clout with the expansion westward uh, by population of westward from the East Coast to the West Coast across the United States. And um, the sheriff here maintained uh, posses which helped them control um, territories and you know these posses were part of the sheriff's office or the sheriff's department in terms of their their earlier versions. Um, here are a couple of pictures of uh, two very uh, one very famous sheriff rather two pictures of one very famous sheriff. Um, this is Joe Arpaia who was the sheriff in Maricopa County, Arizona. And he's kind of a notorious sheriff um, by way of his practices and he really um, was a very kind of innovative sheriff at this particular time in saving taxpayers money by refusing to build prisons, brick and mortar prisons, and using tent cities to house inmates in low security um, uh, environments um, rather than, you know, building uh, brick and mortar prisons. Uh, which cost millions and millions of dollars uh, to build. And he also used some pretty creative um, methods by which he would uh, sustain them during their, their time in, uh, incarcerated in his facilities. And he would um, use him as work release. He would have them do lots of, um, you know, kind of uh, manual labor for the county as a result of uh, their paying for their own uh, incarceration. Um, 
He was uh, all sued by many prisoners for inhumane treatment, um, the violation of the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. Um, there's a famous case, Graves versus Arpaia. And as a result of that court decision in Graves versus Arpaia, we have what we call um, Graves standards in prisons and correctional institutions now, which are certain standards that must be maintained in terms of uh, mental and physical hygiene for prisoners um, as a result of this lawsuit, which uh, the sheriff um, lost at the civil suit, which the sheriff lost. He'd also been sued by the Justice Department and held in contempt both civilly and criminally by uh, federal judges in Arizona um, over the years. And he just recently was um, uh, not elected sheriff or decided not to run for sheriff. And he was sheriff for over 20 years um, in Maricopa County. And um, so it was kind of uh, uh, one of those things where the, early on, people really, uh, you know, embraced his model of policing, his rural model of policing. And Maricopa County is a very large county in Arizona, 10,000 plus square miles, includes the city of Phoenix, Glendale, Scottsdale, and many of the unincorporated areas within Maricopa County that run all the way from um, Gila Bend down the, near the Mexican border, all the way up into the mountains. Um, and and uh, so, uh, he had a very large area again, and uh, lots of different um, uh, cities and towns and in, in unincorporated areas that uh, his sheriff's deputies policed during that particular time. He was a popular figure early on, um, but he wound up costing, costing the taxpayers of Maricopa County in Arizona millions of dollars in defending lawsuits that were brought uh, by prisoners um, again and again uh, that were incarcerated in his facility. Um, constables, this traced back to Anglo-Saxon times. They were kind of unspecialized uh, persons. They were kind of the enforcement arm of the crown, if you will, the of the king, doing the king's bidding. Um, again, the duties included collecting taxes, supervising highways or roadways and areas and, and serving as a magistrate. In uh, early American uh, colonies, they were given control over the night watch system. You know, um, they were unpaid volunteers with little prestige and popularity here in the United States. Um, they had, they were, they had much more um, responsibilities in the UK than they did here in the United States. The coroner has had different roles throughout the history, and you know you probably have seen this from time to time, looking at various police uh, police shows or shows like Quincy. He was the the county coroner, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know they they did things like coroner's inquests to determine the cause of death of a party and, and the parties responsible for it, and so they looked at you know they were kind of like the the precursor to today's uh, medical examiner, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. And today, the coroner has a, you know, very uh, limited functions, really. Um, uh, although their primary function is to determine the cause of all deaths by violence un or under suspicious circumstances. You know, that's part of the coroner's inquest. It's almost akin to the early model of a grand jury. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been debate over the coroner's qualifications over years, especially during, you know, um, the 20th and 21st century. Um, most today, most states have adopted what they call the medical examiner model or the medical examiner system, although there's still some rural coroners uh, uh, rural coroners um, out there that mostly in the southwest and southeastern United States <clears throat> that still have a coroner's model, but they report to or are under control of the state chief medical examiner of the state. But, you know, just to, it really depends on how they're set up state by state. 
the Justice of the Peace. Um, JPs uh, appeared as early as uh, 1195 in England, and they presided over, you know, criminal trials. They issued warrants of arrest. Um, you know, uh, they have had kind of a, a jaded past, especially here in, in the Americas. Um, American Justice of the Peace have limited jurisdiction. It's really about the civil, um, civil uh, uh, issues. In some states, they have jurisdiction over minor uh, criminal cases, um, low-level misdemeanors where jail time is not an option or, or a penalty, more of a fines and costs kind of things. And they're usually lay persons or what they call inexperts, you know, and they uh, they try to uphold the law based on common practices. Um, and today you find in, in many states a justice of the peace, you know, is a civil officer of the court that can preside over things like marriage ceremonies. Um, and, you know, people go to the justice of the peace to get married if they don't want to have a big wedding. And after they have uh, obtained a marriage license or marriage certificate from the clerk of the circuit court, they can then go and have it executed by the justice of the peace. Um, <clears throat> In the early English system of policing, we had kind of a voluntary system, which was uh, informal. And we saw this begin to decline uh, by the 1800s due to the, the collapse of the two primary offices, the constable and justice of the peace. Um, and there was a, a migration, if you will, in, in um, population from rural communities or agricultural communities or agrarian communities to um, the growth in large cities as a result of the Industrial Revolution and people looking for jobs in manufacturing and commerce. Um, and it simply became too big a job in, the, in those environments um, and they needed to move to a more professional um, model uh, of policing and hence kind of the, the move from uh, constables and JPs to magistrates in, in England. Um, in early colonial uh, America and the early colonies, um, the colonies were mostly free of crime. We didn't have much much crime that we you know speak of, at least crime as we know of uh, it today. And the, really, the two crime waves during the early settlement periods in the 1600s were the Quaker Puritan conflict, which was based mostly on religion and ideology, and not real crime as we as we know it today. And that was uh, about 10 years from 1856 to the 1865. And then again, later in the 1600s in the Salem witch trials in the Salem, Massachusetts in the area of New England, again, which was based mostly on religion and ideology. Uh, policing in the, in the uh, in colonial America uh, was mostly citizen participation. Um, and uh, what we saw, there was a little bit of a breakdown in the mid 18th century when we saw there was a, a social and political unrest contributed to the need for a more formal system of policing. <clears throat> and that more formal system of policing was really um, as a result of the struggles uh, between the colonists and the British loyalists um, who were um, loyal to King James and those um, uh, colonists who wanted to, you know, shed the tyranny of the crown and uh, become independent from England. And as a result, King James sent British troops to occupy the colonies to put down the unrest. And they were the law. It was still under British rule at that particular time until the Declaration of Independence and the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Uh, they were still under 
British British rule. So they considered this political unrest to be, you know, criminal behavior. And that's how most of it was seen at that particular time. Um, that, you know, people who opposed the British rule were, were you know, criminals, uh, not because they were committing crimes, because they were just not loyal to King James. <clears throat> The legacies of the uh, colonial period. So the colonists committed to what we call local control or territories. They took care of themselves in these local enclaves, towns, boroughs, um, and uh, opposed. They were opposed to centralized policing, um, and uh, you know they, which was quite different than that in England. You know everybody then came back to the king, which was very centralized. Here they were worried about, you know the smaller communities and what was good for those communities might not be good for other communities or other colonies in other states. <clears throat> and so this was kind of the development and the beginning of the birth of what we call republicanism, which is local interest supported and promotes the general welfare. So local people support the general welfare and supports more local people um, and their activities and keeping things local. And so we see this as the very beginning of, you know, the municipal model of policing where you have cities, towns and counties and the police are responsible for policing those environments. <clears throat> it wasn't until much later that we thought, you know, we, we, we had the idea of, you know, the state police and then today we still don't have a national police force um, because we're opposed to that. We like the local control and the of our law enforcement and of public officials. Um, <clears throat> and when we talk about, you know, a democracy, we have a democracy, but this democracy is also a republic, which means we send local representatives to be part of a national government. And those local representatives are seen as, you know, members of the House of of, of uh, representatives and there's 435 members of the House of Representatives all elected from local districts within their states <clears throat> and that's kind of the growth of republicanism and that's how we see it and in, in, saw it back then and that's kind of the vision as it played out over the, the, the last 247 plus years. Um, so the beginning of the theory of crime prevention and local control was born at the same time, you know, again, looking out for one another and what was, what our needs were locally was part of the, of the, uh, crime prevention, uh, model at this particular time. <clears throat> so there began to be some new experiments, uh, in policing in London. And London uh, they, they, they kind of laid the foundation, and that was the magistrate system. So we had first magistrate was Henry Fielding, and then his, later his brother, uh, John Fielding. Um, and they were the magistrates of the Bow Street Runners, which was a uh, detectives that worked for the magistrates down on Bow Street, which was a uh, street, a uh, famous area. <laughs> along the Thames River, which was very important to commerce um, because that's where all the, the ports were and they had a high crime rate there as a result of all of those things that drive commerce, goods, services, things to be stolen, things to be sold. And um, as a result, um, they came up with this magistrate system in England um, to help thwart that. And then um, Patrick Calhoun, the magistrate of London in 1792, focused on policing reforms. You know, he, they still didn't have an organized policing agency. They had, you know, these kind of loose knit groups um, that helped police um, like the Bow Street Runners. Um, and yet the, uh, the, he talked about police should uh, policing at this time should maintain the public order, uh, prevent and detect crime, and um, 
you know, correct bad manners and morals, you know, kind of like uh, the moral police as well. Um, but yet they didn't have a full time paid professional policing service. They were <clears throat> kind of hired by, you know, the trading companies to look over and prevent theft of their own properties. Um, and they answered to the magistrates at that particular time. And, uh, but they had some precursors to things like intelligence services, you know, who was stealing what, where are they going, what's happening, you know, they, it, <clears throat> they worked on informants and things like that. They had uh, criminal registers where they would record um, the names and contact information of people and, uh, who were, um, you know, uh, accused of committing crimes. They had police gazettes where they would publish um, <clears throat> the names and, and uh, identities of people who were arrested and convicted of crimes. And, you know, again, they were trying to move towards a more professional police service. And then the trading companies there down on the Thames River, you know, um, really kind of, they were private police forces, um, not paid by taxpayer money, but more of like a, a, a a security force paid by the trading companies um, who ran an uh, operations along the Thames River to support, uh, you know, international commerce. And here is a book called The First English Detectives by uh, J.M. Beattie. Um, and it talks about the, uh, the uh, Bow Street Runners and the magistrate system from about 1750s through 1850s, about 100 years of this. Um, so <clears throat> there was uh, a member of the House of Commons by the name of Robert Peel, and um, he had tried for decades to get some real police reform in in London. And then um, the third time he put the the legislation to the floor of both the House of Commons and the and the House of Lords, um, they uh, enacted the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829 as a result of all the work that Sir Robert Peel did on justifying why there was a need for a paid professional police force um, that was responsible only to the government, um, not necessarily to the trading companies and private citizens, but was responsible to the government. And hence, uh, the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829 was passed and uh, it stressed crime prevention, um, with created the London Metropolitan Police Department, and um, it was not well received initially by the people of London, um, but it kind of grew on them as a result, and they were very uh, proud of their accomplishments in trying to get these uh, officers, you know, into the public view and into the public um and they were called Bobbies as a result of the name Robert. Um, a nickname for Robert is Bobby, and so they called him Bobbies. And there was, you know, um, a lot of community uh, activity around the creation of, of the London Metropolitan Police Department. And they had Peel's nine principles of policing. Most are still relevant in today's policing. And they relate closely to the tenets of community, of modern community policing. You know, um, walking foot patrols, working on crime prevention, working with people to help prevent crime rather, and working with individuals who, who you know, understand that you know, we need to have, uh, you know, locked doors and, you know, people looking out for one another and things like that. Things that we, we would, you know, really kind of stress today, you know, um, in, in the community policing, working with one another to prevent crime. And then once crime happens, you know, see something, say something kind of thing. <clears throat> um, and it was more, it, 
it, it was unlike American policing where they were much more um, mannered or genteel, if you will, and force was only used as a last resort. And uh, it's kind of the kind of the the tenants today of you know most of of the London Metropolitan Police um, are still unarmed um, and don't have this armed presence. Although they do now have armed police officers as a result of kind of the the modern crime wave in in <laughs> the European Union and in London. But for for decades and decades and decades, they went unarmed um, as a result of this kind of just being able to work with the community to help each other out in terms of uh, identification and prevention of, of crime. So your police reforms, you see that uh, during the first several years, there's, you know, <clears throat> after the creation, there are a lot of turnover and it took you know, more than what they said, 5,000 dismissals um, uh, of people because they just weren't the right people. They wanted people with good moral character, not just thugs working. And here's a picture of uh, the early, early uh, bobbies in the London Metropolitan Police Department. And they were just, they wore these big hats so they could be seen, you know, in public, standing on the corners, over, watching over uh, the communities. Um, and, uh, you know, to this day, they still um, have remnants of their early uh, um, uh, uniforms, if you will, um, you know, with the tall hats or the pith helmets kind of a look to them. So America at this time, you know, was still, still, you know, um, growing, if you will, and uh, English policing models came to the United States. The Americans observed Peel's success in England in the large towns, um, and uh, there was uh, less industrialization and social upheaving in the United States. Um, at this particular time and uh, less of a need for a full-time policing agency uh, for most large cities or in the in the United States and we were just beginning to kind of as this is the birth of the nation this is only 20 plus years after the American Revolution um, and uh, the Declaration of Independence and you know maybe 50 years or so after the creation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So, um, you know, you had a lot of growing pains in cities and cities and communities were just beginning to kind of understand the needs associated with uh, policing. And eventually policing, uh, what became entrenched in America beginning in the mid 1800s, and um, the first areas, the first colonies, or first large cities, rather, that um, had paid professional police agencies were Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, New Orleans, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Newark, New Jersey. And one of the things that you might see that what do they have all of these cities have in common is that they have a large center of commerce um, uh, that is structured around shipping and ports. You know, the Port of Philadelphia, the Port of New York, um, Chicago along the Great Lakes, and the New Orleans, the Mississippi River, Cincinnati, the Ohio River, the Chesapeake Bay, um, in Baltimore, in Newark, uh, you see, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, commerce um, up and down the um, navigable waterways of the East Coast. And this, you know, gradually spread across the country. And here are the three eras of policing, and we'll discuss, you know, in depth as we kind of move through them throughout the uh, throughout the course. And the first, the political era is, you know, the 1840s to the 1930s. And it was all about politics, you know, who knew who and who could establish what. 
Um, and then you moved later into the reform era where you were talking about, you know, law and professionalism, you know, policies, practices, standards, procedures began to take precedent over, you know, just who knew who and uh, political patronage. And then in the 1980s, we moved from the reform era of policing, you know, after we felt like we were professional enough to move on to then work on community support and, and community relations, which, you know, haven't, haven't worked out so well for us um, as a whole over this particular time period from the, uh, you know, the 1980s to present times. And, you know, we're probably in, you know, uh, the, the, the waning hours, if you will, of the community era of policing. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll discuss hopefully here, you know, what's, what's the next era of policing um, <clears throat> and uh, how do we get there from here and what, what is it going to take? And again, some more of the uh, table that kind of looks at various aspects of each one of these eras of policing. And like, again, we'll, we'll spend more time as we move through there. The political era from 1840s to the 1930s, you know, first moved to improve policing in, the New, in New York, um, 1836. And again, it wasn't until, you know, later to the, the New York state legislature established a full-time uh, police force in 1844. And, you know, there are some things that would kind of spur this on. Um, and one of them was the uh, uh, the death of Mary Rogers as in, in 1841. And then there were various uh, other episodes along the way and the Civil War came, uh, you know, occurred about this time. And then you saw things like uh, <laughs> the United States Secret Service was established by Congress in 1865. <laughs> and it, its mission was not executive protection at that particular time. It was about counterfeiting of the federal note. So the Confederate states were counterfeiting the federal note to pay for their war effort because they were broke and didn't have any money. And so it wasn't until, you know, in the early 1900s, in 1903, um, that the United States Secret Service was charged with the protecting the president after the assassination of President McKinley. And it was only due to proximity is that the White House and the Treasury Building occupied the same space. And so they were already, you know, um, securing the treasury, the United States treasury. And so they kind of morphed into then securing the White House and um, the executive office buildings, etc. cetera, um, as a result of, um, again, the assassination of uh, President McKinley. And then hence the new mission of the Secret Service was born. But all of these things kind of had a synergistic effect on policing in the uh, in the United States at this particular time. <clears throat> then you had in the South the slave patrols or uh, the slave code and it was, uh, you know, the Southern slave patrols and you had as a result of some court cases um, in the what we call the Reconstruction era of the South, both during and post Civil War. Um, some of the events that impacted policing efforts in the South was the Dred Scott decision in 1857, the Emancipation Procla Proclamation in 1863, and then the uh, oh, obviously Jim Crow laws and segregation, but also really the 13th and 14th Amendment of the of the uh, Constitution in the Bill of Rights really pushed forward um, the those things expressed in the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Um, and there were some court decisions along the way as well that helped push um, for e equal rights for f both uh, freed people in the South. Um, and um, what would happened is that it was everybody in the United States was covered by, as a result of, of the 13th and 14th Amendment, was covered by the protections of the Constitution. 
everyone and there was no more slavery and so there was no more people or slaves being considered property they were individuals with rights established by the constitution and that really kind of changed how policing was seen through throughout the south as well because of these court decisions and then here are you know kind of some brief excerpts of the 13th and 14th amendment um, they were ratified in 1865 and 1868 respectively and again it granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the united states including former slaves um, and guaranteed all citizens equal protection in the law and uh and it basically the 13th amendment basically says that no one could be enslaved anymore um, and the only way somebody could be enslaved or held in prison is if they were duly convicted of a crime, um, you know, based on uh, the, the laws of the Constitution in the United States. <clears throat> So the American plan of policing, some of the issues and traditions, you know, police under control of city, uh, of a city governments or city and town governments, you know, um, and we say cities because at this particular time, you know, those were the kind of the, the largest uh, uh, collectivities of people, you know, by demographics were in cities and that's where kind of policing began to grow. Um, wasn't until much later we talked about counties and state police and all the apparatus associated with, you know, kind of um, suburban and rural policing um, at that particular time. Um, patrol districts were determined by city wards and not criminal activity. There's, you know, kind of the political era of policing at this time beginning to kind of show um, selection of officers encouraged by political patronage. Again, you know, the pol politics of policing were, were rather um, rampant at that particular time. Chiefs had no power to hire, you know, or, they, or assign duties or fire people. They was really just kind of, they just oversaw the, the bureaucracy of the police department. And it was really the political bosses at the time, you know, the 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 aldermen and the town councils or the city councils or you know at that particular time they kind of ran these departments by proxies through chiefs and they carried you you know put on uniforms carried firearms and you know there was the use of force associated with their roles and responsibility and this is kind of the the beginning of the you know american policing model the expansion westward in the American frontiers, you know, absent of government created, uh, absent of government created variety of policing in the West. There was a lot of, you know, uh, vigilantism, if you will. And so groups, uh, four groups assumed responsibility for law enforcement, private citizens, the vigilantes that we just talked about, um, posses, bounty hunters. Um, then there was the U.S. Marshals, which were, Marshals were created by the um, uh, Federal Judiciary Act of 1791, and they were officers of the court. Um, they were, they were to enforce court orders. They really weren't police in the sense, but when uh, federal judges gave orders about how things should be done. The U.S. Marshals would go out and enforce those orders, um, <clears throat> and as a result, they, uh, you know, they kind of uh, obtained law enforcement powers and authority and duties throughout the United States as a result of being, um, you know, the ar the enforcement arm of the federal courts. And then, kind of to that to that end, um, they had the Texas Rangers, which in the territories of Texas, they very much very similar to that of the Marshals, um, but they had uh, a bit more of a you know of a, a, a authority in agriculture and um, those issues associated with the West. Um, and then you had business persons, um, you know, hiring 
protection for stagecoaches, trains, you know, transportation, livestock, agriculture, all those things that needed to be protected, you know, had, uh, were, were part of the law enforcement apparatus. <clears throat> and, uh, you see some early, early, um, uh, models of that in, you know, the stagecoach, uh, um, Wells Fargo agents, um, you know, who protected stagecoach. They also were, had law enforcement responsibilities along the roads and the routes, um, you know, that the stagecoaches traveled and it, you know, and that came and then the trains came and then they also began to have these law enforcement activities and duties associated with interstate commerce and transportation. And these things kind of morphed into the systems of policing that we have today. Um, town officials and safety were important as well. And so, you know, they hired marshals and sheriffs <clears throat> and, you know, it wasn't until later that, uh, you know, sheriffs began to be elected as states came into play and state constitutions were written and sheriffs were constitutional officers that were duly elected by the constituents of the state. And um, so the, there was a, you know, pretty, pretty deep entrenchment of 20th century uh, policing uh, by way of political influence. And, um, you know, there was this decentralized style, which was consistent with kind of the early legacies of American policing. They didn't want centralized policing. <clears throat> Officers were recruited from ethnic groups within the community because there was a lot of ethnicity and by way of, of communities, you know, and how they were structured by way of political influences in, you know, areas of cities, major cities. And there was a lack of organizational control that contributed to inefficiency and kind of disorder, if you will, during this particular time as there was, you know, the policing and municipal state and local bureaucracy was in its infancy. And so, you know, it's kind of learn as you go, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> so there was increased political uh, uh, increased political and cor uh, corruption associated with policing at this uh, particular time. And, uh, you know, the ethics, um, there was uh, religious disputes were common in police departments, you know, between different ethnicities and um, different religions. Uh, political influence affected promotions, assignments, transfers, you know, political page patronage over merit system was who you knew rather than how well you did the job. Um, and all of these things, again, like we're in the very infancy of uh, police um, uh, bureaucracies. And, um, you know, at, at, during this time, much of this uh, process was, you know, uh, kind of make it up as you go and, uh, you know, see what works for you and then see what doesn't work for you. Um, policing was a popular job, you know, you get steady work and high pay at that particular time, or at least, uh, you know, steady wages, maybe not so much, uh, such high pay, but, uh, tradition was a key determinant to police behavior. You know, police corruption began to surface who was in charge, who was, you know, on whose take kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, this kind of permeated early American policing, especially through the early 1900s. Uh, police dealt with riots and strikes, um, parades, fires, you know, they were kind of a, did it all at that particular time um, during the Great Depression. And, you know, they had their ups and downs. Um, oftentimes they didn't get paid because there was no money coming into the municipalities. Um, cities became more orderly during the late 19th century. Um, and, you know, these, these bureaucracies um, <clears throat> began to 
to come together over time. Um, and you could see how policing then started to move towards the next era, um, which would be the reform era, you know, starting in the 1930s, reformers sought to remove political involvement and political influence from policing. And civil service systems were created to eliminate this political patronage. So you were moving away from who you know to really what you did. And um, that was a big step in terms of attracting you know, new people to policing and making it more professional. The focus on crime control over social work <clears throat> and non-criminal activities. You know, so now we were really looking at crime control issues and not worried about you know, too much about what was happening in, in the neighborhood that wasn't crime related. And we began to, you know, apply science to the law. So you had scientific theories of uh, administration um, advocated by Frederick Taylor. And he emphasized on production and unity of control and things like that. So there was, you know, kind of a, a, a process, a method to the madness of policing began to began to formulate um, during this time, in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, police leaders uh, routinized or, you know, what I mean by routinized, there was a there was a method to the work process. And that's what we call by routine or routinized police work and limited discretion um, as much as possible. <clears throat> you know, record crime rates during the 1960s and 70s, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act occurred at that particular time, the law Enf enforcement um, assistance administration was created by the federal government and the law enforcement education program was also created to help professionalize police agencies across the board during this later in later years of the reform era of policing. And, you know, there was a lot going on from, you know, the mid early 1900s to you know, the 1970s and 1960s um, that we saw in policing. Some uh, of the key uh, contributors uh, in the development of professional policing, it was August Vollmer, um, Vollmer's key innovations included, and this was early 1900s, you know, moving into the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and this was, a, you know, kind of the beginning of this, what we call the key development of professionalism. And um, Vollmer's in, uh, innovations included a, um, a leading proponent of police professionalism, uh, college uh, students as police recruits, um, selection criteria, um, application test, applicant testing, began to put radios in cars, police training academies, formal police training programs, criminal investigation and laboratories with, you know, full-time criminalists. Um, those kinds of things really helped um, completely mobile police forces, cars and motorcycles you know, being able to, to get around the communities uh, more easily. And, um, you know, also at the same time, we started to, to kind of migrate back to the uh, advocating police as social workers, trying to fix problems wherever these problems may have occurred. And moving forward, um, so the Worker Shame Commission in 1925 was the first um, national study of crime in criminal justice. And um, what came out of this was it report made many recommendations calling for increase in police professionalism. And so it kind of put into place some of the things that were already happening um, and on some of these uh, contributions from people like August Vollmer and 
um, others um, were beginning to take hold in terms of kind of official report processes and recommendations such as the merit selection and promotion, testing, credentialing and education and beginning minimum standards for police officers across the country. These were recommendations and of course most of these things were controlled by state governments at this particular time in, in the early 1900s. Um, and the recommendations were reported, but not all were implemented. Um, you know, it was, it was, these were kind of like best practices, if you will, and agencies could, you know, begin to move that direction or move that way um, as they were required. Um, crime fighter image, you know, uh, associated with policing. So you had O.W. Wilson, who was a leading authority on police administration at this particular time. Um, he was in Los Angeles, of course, you know, Los Angeles, LAPD was a large city and things were beginning to move and boom in that area. And they became really part of the, you know, um, establishment of police practices, the best practices and professionalism um, came to mean, you know, a combination of both managerial efficiency and technology, technical or technological sophistication, if you will, and the emphasis on crime fighting. So you had kind of this com combination of professional um, bureaucracy and management and processes also accompanied by you know, technology, radios, criminalistics, and all those things that were used to kind of together fight crime in a much, much more um, effective and cohesive manner. Uh, the role of police uh, was redefined. You had this image of a crime fighter became more popular, you know, during Prohibition with, you know, people like Elliot Ness and the, the G-men of the late uh, 1920s and 30s prior to Prohibition. Um, and uh, during Prohibition, and then um, the role of the citizen in crime control was diminished. You know, we weren't looking for people in the community to solve problems because only in th at this particular time, along with this kind of managerial efficiency came this aura of only we can solve crime. You know, the lay person is, you know, more is not responsible for solving crime, but only the professionals, hence the professionalism. So there was some, you know, give and take in this roles and, and acceptance of policing practices uh, across the United States. And then J. Edgar Hoover rose to prominence, you know, um, started in 1924 with what we call the Department of Justice had the Bureau of Investigation. And then later, um, Congre Congress uh, formally authorized the creation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation about nine years later in 1933, at which J. Edgar Hoover became the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And then he contributed to some other um, key aspects of policing throughout uh, the United States <clears throat> as well, professionalizing police. Um, uh, Willie Parker um, the, coined the term the thin blue line. This is a chief in LAPD at this particular time. Um, you know, he was a try. He was a he was a lawyer. He's a, a trial prosecutor before he was the police chief. And uh, there were conflicts between uh, effective police operations and individual rights, and um, so that kind of should be resolved in in. Parker's view um, that those issues should be resolved in favor of the police. And here we saw, you know, the rights of society took precedence over individual liberties. So we're, we're talking about, you know, for the greatest good um, versus, you know, preservation of individual liberties. And all of these things kind of led to the modern police apparatus, the bureaucracy, um, and the the professionalism overall um, of the of the policing environment. You know, from uh, training to standards, 
um, all of those things that, um, you know, were needed, um, but could easily go too far if left unchecked. Then there was a President's Commission on, uh, a President's Crime Commission rather, so it's a national commission focused on uh, solutions to America's internal crime problems. And this was during the Lyndon Johnson presidency, which is the late 1960s. And, you know, the biggest uh, issue for America at that particular crime time was crime in the Vietnam War. And you can't kind of separate the two out because we had, you know, the civil rights movement, we had social upheaval, we had social activism, we had the Vietnam War, we had the protests for the war. We had um, lots of things going on at this particular time, and it brought back uh, some of the, uh, the policing, you know, uh, uh, nine principles of Peel's uh, principles, you know, kind of the full circle brought them back into view, so to speak. So uh, brought policing full circle back to the principles laid out by, you know, Sir Robert Peel, the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829. So a hundred years or more later, 150 years later, we're kind of still looking at these same uh, policing uh, principles that Peel defined in the early creation. And so, you know, things do come full circle. Um, and so there was kind of this systematic, uh, demolition of the assumption of the underlying political era of policing, you know, and, and, and the need to move to, you know, through all of these police reforms to this professional era. And as a result, you know, there were things that occurred that, you know, that definitely moved policing forward, but at the same time, uh, also left unchecked could hold policing back. And this kind of laid the foundation for com the community era of uh, policing. <clears throat> and uh, 1960s and 70s and struggle over uh, civil rights. And this was a very tumultuous time in American history is civil disobedience, uh, progress in the civil rights movement across the country, um, you know, kind of a clash of cultures, if you will. The 1968 Democratic National Convention, where you had violent protests and radicalism and police in Chicago at that particular time, um, were seen, uh, you know, beating protesters and anti war protesters and, you know, people who didn't have the same political views. Um, as the incumbents at that particular time. Um, and so the police focused, um, you know, on trying to adhere to this professional model um, and removed from all, you know, uh, what we, you know, personal contact with the public. They kind of stepped back and didn't engage the public, much like what happened in the depolicing function. Um, there were major race riots and social disorder um, ar around the country at this particular time. And, you know, the police then relied on what they call the crime control methods to keep order, which was, you know, getting away from the community, just stopping, you know, crime by any means necessary. And most of it was by, you know, the application of force, especially in these, um, you know, protests and civil disobedience. Um, venues. Failure of the police community relations really was kind of at the forefront of this. You know, we were thought we were doing well at that particular time. And then we came into the activism period of the 1960s and 70s. And we kind of got away from any kind of, you know, community relations um, <clears throat> uh, thoughts whatsoever in policing. And then here are some major events that changed policing and the criminal justice system, you know, across the board. And this was, you know, in the the late, you know, the 60s into the 70s and into the 80s. So the civil rights movement and there's some, you know, different uh, tags here. The Brown versus Board of Education in 1972, 1972 Equal Employment Act, the um, assassination of JFK, 
Um, you know, the assassination of Dr. King, Martin Luther King in 1968 in Memphis, uh, along at the same time, the Vietnam War, 1965 to 1975, you know, kind of the, the, the violent protests, the killing of the students, protesters at Kent State University by the Ohio National Guard, the, whoops, the 1968 Democratic National Convention, which I talked of just a few minutes ago. At the same time, we had record crime rates during the 1960s and 70s. We had the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act that were enacted to kind of help push forward, you know, police professionalism. In New York City, we had the Knapp Commission that looked at crime and corruption within the New York City Police Department. Um, and what was happening there at the beginning of the war on drugs and how drugs affected, you know, corruption and greed within these major city police departments, which was an eye opener to many Americans. Um, and then we kind of moved into the homeland security. These were, uh, you know, post 9-11. So we had the war on terror declared after 9-11. We talked, you know, leading to the suspension of rights of enemy combatants and the, the constitutional limbo that was uh, uh, of people who were, you know, arrested or held in Guantanamo Bay. You had then kind of the police and the Black Lives Matter movement. You had the killings of unarmed black uh, males uh, used by police, um, which kind of fueled the Black Lives Matter movement, the defund the police movement, and then we lead to Ferguson, Missouri, and the death of Michael Brown at the hands of the police that kind of led to, you know, uh, the, the most, the beginning of the police reform and defund the police movement, you know, and then of course all the others, um, you know, more recent, you know, um, Walter Scott and, and, uh, and Eric Gardner, Walter Scott in South Carolina, Eric Gardner in New York City, and then George Floyd in, um, in uh, Minneapolis. And, and there are many others along the way, by no means am I minimizing any of them, but those are kind of the major uh, milestones associated um, with, uh, you know, some of these issues. And one thing I didn't mention, and we will mention is, you know, back here in the early 1990s was uh, the, um, the, uh, Rodney King issue in Los Angeles, which was kind of viewed at the time. I mean, there was riots as a result of of the Rodney King, the Watts riots, but it was also kind of an anomaly uh, at that particular time. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, it was the first one, the first police brutality case that was kind of really f videoed and picked up by, you know, major media networks that kind of ran, um, uh, you know, these stories day and night and, um, you know, really scrutinized the, the police process and the investigations, the internal affairs, the charging of police officers, um, the exoneration of police officers, the charging of officers by the federal government for violation of civil rights and 1983 actions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of those things that came <laughs> as a result of, you know, police um, misconduct and the mistrust between police and communities. And then we're entering into the community era, which is 1980 to present. So we talk about team policing, sound principles, you know, but poorly planned and hastily implemented, you know, all of these kinds of things, you know, just trying to get a foothold back into communities with, you know, um, <clears throat> problem solving approach, you know, using technologies now, crime analysis, um, uh, problem oriented policing techniques, the reemergence of social work skills for policing, you know, and uh, we'll take a closer look at the community policing um, aspect in chapter four. But, you know, these are all things, you know, the kind of we we can't forget about the history of policing and you know there are are some you know real questions about what needs to happen um in policing uh moving forward so that's um 
really all I have for you for this lecture, and it ran over more than a little bit, but um, I think we covered everything we need to cover in uh, chapter one. And so with that, um, we'll stay tuned for the next uh, lecture and assignments um, for chapter two. Thank you.